गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल वेलकम टू दी फोर्टी एडिशन ऑफ फायर पॉटिटी फायर पॉटिटी इज ब्रिंगिंग लाइक माइंडेड पीपल टूगेदर एंड एक्सप्लोर नॉलेज एंड या इट्स बीन अ लॉन्ग टाइम एंड आई टेक दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू थैंक एवरी पीपल बिहाइंड दिस ऑफकोर्स यू गाइज हैव बीन गिवन अस ट्रेमेंड द सपोर्ट फ्राम द बिगिनिंग सो ह्यूज थैंक्स टू यू गाइज एंड नॉर्मली फायर पॉटिटी इज स्टार्ट विद टेक बैट्स Tech Byte is a quick review of technological update which happened over the last one month. So I invite my colleague Rashmi to carry on the Tech Byte. Please. Good afternoon, all. Let's take a quick look at some of the top updates from the tech world since our last Fire Potato session. To begin with, Google has announced general availability of its database storage products, which includes the Cloud SQL. cloud big table and the cloud data store the cloud sql as you may be aware of is google's fully managed database storage service for mysql database cloud sql generation 2 is now available which is seven times more faster and has 20 times more storage capability than generation 1 and speaking of performance when compared to aws rds the relational database storage using aurora Cloud SQL delivers two times more transactions per second at 50% less latency per transaction. Next, the Cloud uh, Big Table. Cloud Big Table is Google's fully managed database storage service for uh, NoSQL database using big data. Big Table has been specifically designed uh, to handle massive workloads at less latency and very high throughput and is best suited for both operational as well as analytical applications big table it is uh, the same database that pass almost all of google's core services like uh, google maps google analytics search gmail and is now generally available The cloud data store is Google's fully managed database storage service for NoSQL document database. A number of customers have already built several amazing both web and mobile applications on top of it. Uh, Snapchat, for instance, has a number of Android apps on top of uh, the data store. And the data store is an ideal choice for even the toughest web and mobile applications, and is HBase client compatible. Next, uh, let's take a look at some news from the PHP world. Laravel 5.3 has been released. Uh, the new, uh, all the features are focused on improving developer performance by uh, making making some enhancements for common tasks. Laravel Scout is a new driver-based full-text search engine for Laravel's ORM. the eloquent laravel passport gives you everything that you need to set up oo2 within a few minutes laravel notifications lets you send quick updates through services like slack text messages email etc migrations lets you roll back a single migration which was not at possible until this release speaking about pagination uh, laravel offers styles for pagination the advanced style that lists all the page numbers and a simple style with just the previous and next links from this release onwards the simple style is available as a separate view file so that it can be very easily customized another feature worth mentioning is a new blade variable laravel's templating engine blade now has a new variable dollar loop which gives you more fine control within loops Nuga is out. The much awaited Nuga has finally reached end users through Nexus devices to start with. The Android 7 source code is also now publicly available at the AOSP the Android Open Source project. The new features include brand new JIT or AOT compiler which helps to improve software performance, make app installs faster and take up less storage space. uh direct reply feature that lets you uh reply directly to notifications without having to open up the app 
Support for Vulcan, which is a low performance, a very, sorry, low overhead, uh, high performance, uh, meant for high performance 3D graphics. And uh, the multi-window feature that lets you run two apps at the same time. And there are also several additional encryption and security features like file-based encryption, seamless updates, and direct boot. Some updates around the social media. WhatsApp uh, originally built to respect user privacy and uh, with the goal of knowing as little as possible about the user has now announced that they'll be sharing a limited amount of data with parent company Facebook, which includes uh, the user contact numbers, uh, for contact lists, and usage data. The sharing is meant for Facebook uh, to offer better friend suggestions by mapping the user's connections across the two uh, services, and also to deliver more relevant ads on the social network. And uh, finally, before we conclude, let's meet the birthday boys. Both Linux and the World Wide Web celebrated their 25th birthday this August. So it's been 25 years since the common man made its, his first click on the internet. A small click for man, a big leap for the mankind. And that's all from the Tech Byte section this time. Do join us every time. Thank you. Thank you, Rashmi. And uh, yeah, we're going to enter a main session. And the relay of this month, the session on Big Data and Hadoop, uh, led by uh, Mr. Deepak Verma. He's a director of Technospeed Consulting, Cochin. And Mr. Deepak has 20 years of experience in strategic marketing, operation management, and sales with local and Indian companies. He's also an expert in cloud, mobility, and big data. He has worked in the SME segment over the last years with clients like Emma Play, Smart Cousins, Springbox, and he is a passionate soft skill trainer and is a proven technical business person. He has an experience in vertical of healthcare, government, automotive, and telecom sectors in IT service and product. So I invite Mr. Deepak to carry on the 540. Please. Good evening and wish you all a very happy Thank you very much for inviting me here and uh, we'll be speaking today on uh, Big Data, Hadoop. A little bit in the end if we have time we'll talk on cloud and also IoT. Okay, but we'll focus initially on Big Data and Hadoop. So this is how uh, I intend the presentation to be. You know, I plan to spend around 30 minutes on the first column, 30 minutes on the second column, and 30 on the last. So how does that sound? Seems good? Anything else that you'll need to learn? Okay, I don't plan to speak anything on any of these things. I plan to talk on very basic things very fundamental things that we all need to know on big data and cloud. I might cover some of this uh, as part of the structure, but I'm not really going to depth on a Wednesday evening and trying to, you know, kind of talk on various other databases, which anyway, most of you know, and most of you are coming from varied backgrounds. So uh, I just thought that will kind of open the phone. I just wanted to understand that uh, how many of you are uh, not software developers? Wonderful. I'm happy. So at least uh, there's some meaning to it. And how many of them are, there were some students? And uh, some CEOs, directors, CMO? Okay, great. So we will start with <coughs> 1943 when Mr. Thomas Watson, he mentioned that there may be a market for not more than five computers. And that's uh, where uh, he began. Or 
a journey mankind began his journey thought process it was a successful uh, mr gates in 19 which is less than maybe 40 where he very clearly mentioned and it is uh, articulated that 640 k ought to be enough for anybody so this is the humble beginnings that we have and uh, from here we have crossed the entire age and come to something and there's a lot of data that is uh, currently being uh, being uh, in being calculated and we'll come to see the reasons why it has been done and we'll also see what the changes and how it is being mined and how it is being calculated so a basically is taken and a terabyte is sent to it's not necessary that any if you know i just wanted to you know kind of go and say that Google in 2008 process around 20 minutes a day and it it's at 29 to 20 which is more than a, more than a exact and uh, not normal terminologies that people know because and then facebook again had 2.5 petabytes of user data with a growing rate of a few times every day and similarly ebay had 6 and a half petabytes of user data and uh, cern's large hardware had 50 petabytes a year so this is uh, the kind of things that have been happening the kind of increases this is a common uh, image which most of us have seen uh, but like i like to draw you to some small conclusion this image so this is uh, you know what happens in one second now in 2012 2014 string is 2012 the second 2013 the third is 2014 so it is small for the people back then but if you, let's say youtube it was 25 hours upload in 2012 increased to 72 hours and 120 hours in 60 seconds on an average and similarly you have for whatsapp and skype and twitter and uh, if you look at Google, it was 6.9 lakhs increased to 10 increased to 4 million searches across the three years 2012 2013 2014 and if you look at instagram it was 3480 photos which increased to 2 lakhs and then again decreased to 41000 over the three years and if you look at whatsapp the famous one it went from 20 billion to 50 million over a period of 24 months and you went from 572 and 120 as i mentioned and uh, so google multiplied six times you know over the over the two years instagram multiplied 10 times whatsapp multiplied two and a half times and youtube multiplied five times and now i'd like to introduce you to a small story it's very unusual uh, that you should hear a story during a tech bit but the line of the atmosphere and this is the story of a chinese Content. It's a rice grain story. So story goes that the president, he came and you know met the emperor, and uh, the emperor had to give him something for a particular task that he had done, a certain reward. So the president took a chess board and said, I mean most of us know the story, and said take one rice grain on the first, you know, board of the chess board, and then keep multiplying it, keep doubling it. and i will take the end result which is on the 64th board so i uh, really agreed and uh, so this was it so one green on the first position double in every position so it's 1 2 4 8 16 32 not a very big figure you know for an emperor and the rice grains which are very cheap in china you know grown uh, easily but it almost make him made him book because by the end of the calculation of the twelfth, it will actually went up to in grains and uh, this is only doubling so if you look at i mean you know conversion to 1 gb of data assuming 1 gb of data on year 1 it increased to 128 gb and 32.78 gb in year 12 it's only an analogy i'm giving uh, that is the kind of figure that has happened only by doubling
and if you look at the entire <laughs> ring of things it went all the way to a letter called e which nobody even is aware of it's actually exabyte and that this entire data was only by doubling one rice of grain across you know all the uh, all the ways and we are actually talking of uh, google going five times yeah, uh, you know youtube going three and a half times uh, year on year so this is actually only doubling and uh, this is the kind of uh, data that we're talking about we are already in petabytes which is you know 10 raised to 15 it might go to exabytes and zettabytes or you know whatever it is all the letters of the alphabet i'd like you to watch a small video If you are sitting in the United States or Europe right now, you've probably never used a Chinese app. But the reality is, if you want to know how the internet will develop, China, the land once known for its cheap ripoffs, has actually become a guide to the future. You know, the internet is the internet. But for China, the internet is more like an intranet. It's largely walled off from the Western world by this incredibly complex system of filters and blocks that we call the Great Firewall. And basically, the Great Firewall blocks any foreign site the Communist Party doesn't think it can control. So that means there is no Facebook, no Twitter, no Google. Instead, what filled the internet vacuum was a generation of Chinese copycats that have grown into huge companies. So for Google, you had Baidu. For YouTube, you had Yoku. For Twitter, you had Sina Weibo. And the list goes on and on. It's almost as if the Chinese internet is a lagoon as an aside to the greater ocean of the internet. And in that lagoon, there are these swamp monster apps that bear some resemblance to the creatures in the ocean, but are mutated in some ways because they evolved in a different kind of environment. But things have started to shift in the sense that before, no one outside of the lagoon really cared about the swamp monsters. But now, all of a sudden, some of the features they've developed are so amazing that Western apps are trying to copy them. And the greatest example of this is WeChat. WeChat is an example of, uh, for lack of a better word, a super app. It's a Swiss army knife that basically does everything for you. It's your WhatsApp, Facebook, Skype, and Uber. It's your Amazon, Instagram, Venmo, and Tinder. But it's other things we don't even have apps for. There are hospitals that have built out whole appointment booking systems. There are investment services. There are even heat maps that show how crowded a place is, be it your favorite shopping mall or a popular tourist site. The list of services goes on basically forever. But it's not the variety of things you can do on WeChat that makes it so powerful. It's the fact that they're all in one app. So why does that matter? Hypothetically, imagine you're sitting at home and one day you notice your corgi is dirty. You open WeChat, hit a few buttons, and a few hours later a man shows up at your door with some shampoo and a big vacuum. Your dog gets cleaned and he looks great. You take a photo, you share it with your friends, and tag the dog cleaning business. You haven't left the app. Your friend who likes Hello Kitty and works a boring office job is slacking off at work and looking at WeChat. She sees the photo of your clean corgi. She decides she wants her poodle clean. She clicks the tag on your photo and orders the same service. Within seconds, the man with the big vacuum is on his way to her house. She pays him, and he's happy because he got paid instantly on WeChat. She starts chatting with you to thank you. Neither of you have left the app. While chatting, she tells you about a new hip noodle joint. She says, you have to come. It's a schlep, but you accept. She orders food while still at her desk. You order a taxi. She pays for the food. On the way to her house, the man with the big vacuum invests the money he earned from both of you into a wealth management product that's probably a little too risky. Neither of you nor the man with the big vacuum have left the app. 
Both of you arrive and the app tells the kitchen you're there. Your WeChat profile photo pops up on the wall. It's an old photo from the year you had that weird part in your hair. Of course she makes a comment. Your food is served. You notice your meat is a bit overcooked, so you snap a photo and post a disparaging restaurant review. You're already on your phone and you remember you still owe your friend money because she paid. You transfer her money. Neither of you, the man with the big vacuum, nor the restaurant have left the app. At the restaurant, there are no menus, there are no waiters, there is no cashier. There is only WeChat. By rolling so many functions into one single app, it's altered the concept of virality. It's no longer just videos or images or tweets that can go viral. It's a dog washer, noodles, all sorts of companies and products that get the push of a social network. Here in China, that network is 700 million people. Sounds great, right? Well, it is, but using a single app to find a date, schedule an oil change, or notarize a document also enables WeChat to collect a staggering volume of personal data. They know what you talk about, who you talk about it with, what you read, where you go, why you're going there, who's there, how you spend money when you're online, how you spend money when you're offline. The list goes on indefinitely. For advertisers, this is a miracle. It's the combined data of Facebook, Amazon, Google, and PayPal, all in one place. The problem is, all of the data is information Chinese companies are forced to share with the Chinese government, which has a long record of human rights violations, and isn't exactly shy about stalking its citizens. So if you're not in China, why does this matter? It matters because we're starting to see a number of Western tech companies attempt to replicate super apps like WeChat. For the companies, it's incredibly powerful. And for you and me, it's a convenient and even transformative technology. But of course, it could also be problematic. Concentrating so much data in so few hands could lay the groundwork for an Orwellian world where companies and governments can track every single movement you make. So, just example of uh, what big data can be, and this is the beginning. So we'll go into you know further application, further use cases of how big data can uh, really change our world, and it is changing it, uh, whether you like it or not. There is a certain shift that is happening, and we all need to be adjusted to it. So. What are the kind of data that we have? So this is also very important to know because we all deal with it, whether you know developers or not. There are four kinds of data, which is the structured, semi-structured, quasi-structured, and unstructured. The structured is quite easy. Most of us are aware. For the for those who are non-software, uh, it's basically transactional and analytical. And uh, the online transactional portal are those which are very clear in Excel sheet or you know which comes in a two-dimensional data and analytical goes a little more in depth where uh, possibly the time element also comes in and uh, there are cubes you know which are analyzed and each of this analysis gives a different kind of a depth to it so that's the structured part of it the semi-structured again on the XML front you have the parsing and again you have the object OEM model with a complex and atomic object so it goes a little bit of a semi-structured in that sense. The quasi-structured, uh, probably not the right example. It not, need not be one particular uh, website. So primarily, this gives a link. Uh, this uh, gives a link of the click stream that a person goes through as and when he browses on, and it could be jumping from site to site. It could be jumping from screen to screen. They also will uh, denote uh, analytics as to which part of the screen did he take, which quadrant, first, second, third, fourth and little more in depth on the placing etc so this is uh, uh, this will give a this will give a kind of a feel as to the browsing methodology that a person uses or uh, some in depth analysis of how the person thinks and which again gives uh, some uh, knowledge on the click stream part of it and that's quasi structured and finally you have the unstructured data which can be print and digital so print which is you know the physical uh, print which needs to be somehow converted to digital and then of course you have the digital where a uh, lot of words coming in and you'll need to kind of figure out 
some analytics, some mathematics out of it. So that's a separate uh, stream that uh, analyzes the data altogether. Any questions so far? Quasi structure basically uh, uh, don't go by this example. So basically, let's say you type on BBC BBC dot co dot UK, and from there you link into some other websites. So quasi structure is basically analysis. Clickstream is basically analysis of the behavioral patterns of various uh, uh, browsers as they go from site to site to get the details of how they move in and how much time they spend, etc. Need not be one single site. There are other examples also. So uh, anything that is in between the parsing. So parsing basically is a XML uh, XML format, and the unstructured is basically you know words in place. Anything that falls in between, in between these two, could be you know on the on the click stream or on the quasi structured front. So it could be data coming in from analytics from uh, financial institutions, which you know are not really in the OLTP or OL, OLAP space, etc. Yes, 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 data feeds, which are not correctly in the OLAP phase. Yes, 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 we yes, did. Any other questions? Feel free to ask any questions. So I'll just be kind of moving ahead. Okay, so this we covered. So what are the challenges? If you look at it, the challenges, and I've kind of put it into three categories, just to make it easy for everybody to learn, the students, so they can kind of memorize. So the first is volume. The second is variety, third is velocity. So this kind of sums up all the challenges in big data. If you kind of you know memorize this, it's uh, good to go. And uh, but each of them have a big uh, wealth of meaning behind it. So what is the volume of data? What is the variety? And what is the velocity of data coming in? We'll start first with velocity, and uh, that's the speed of change of information. In all the four structures, quasi, semi, uh, unstructured, as well as structured, there's a lot of change of information that takes place. And that makes big data very challenging. It's not a static structure. It's always a dynamic structure, always changing. Feeds are changing. Things are changing every second. As every second passes, uh, the information changes. And that makes it very challenging. Second is volume. We did it. We touched upon it. It's exponentially increasing year on year. A lot of other feeds coming in, which is making it go uh, very exponentially high, just like the Chinese emperor and the peasant. And the third is variety. Variety, and I'll actually go on to this a little more in detail. Detail uh, at this point of time, you know, you you have you know words coming in, you have the structures coming, the quasi structures and the semi structures. But soon now people are getting into uh, factors related to emotions and feeling. So this has not been covered till now. It is not any of the four structures. So the four structures are very dynamic, very uh, very clear in a one and zero kind of case. But uh, now people are, you know, kind of interested in know, know the emotions and feelings around it. Let's take a simple case of automated advertising. This is something that I did way back in 2013 in a company called Renault, uh, Renault Nissan, Maxwell Duster, and uh, they were very interested in knowing uh, the trend or the feedback that uh, customers had when they launched the Duster, and they managed to pick up all the four feeds, which is, you know, the structured feed semi quasi and even the unstructured feed for which they had deployed uh, a specific person who will check all the print media but what they really didn't get so you know you start off with basic uh, things on okay you know how many male how many female so this is a basic level of uh, information that we have in any field actually so just numbers you know so many numbers went here so many numbers went there etc in, in in any industry and then you go a little higher and then you have uh, all the structures, the four structures in place, demography, details of you know how they are doing, what they are doing, etc. But that's again from your own limited uh, prejudice or perspective. The larger data happens uh, on emotions. You know how, why exactly are doing it? Uh, you know, what emotions are they displaying? Are they happy, sad? You know, as they use the product, and uh, you know what are the various emotions doing it? And this is a huge data, which is actually still to be untouched, which is still to be tapped just you know, about to begin tapping uh, the AI, the virtual reality, where they're trying to create scenarios of trying to understand that uh, beyond these four structures, we need to get into the uh, emotional aspect of it, which will make the whole thing very realistic. 
So enter Hadoop ar architecture. So I'll explain brief on the Hadoop architecture. It consists of four main parts. I've just tried to uh, you know divide into four parts. You might not find this in any manual or anywhere. I just thought you know it's easier for people to understand it. And uh, the first part is breaking down data into small pieces. So what does Hadoop do? Hadoop is open architecture. Just like I saw Fire, an open stage, open to all. So Hadoop is open architecture. And uh, it's a set of tools okay. which uh, breaks down data, big data into smaller pieces. So that's the first thing that we need to understand. It's a set of tools which uh, attempts to break down big data into smaller pieces. And it has various methods of doing it. I'll get into a small case study at the end on something that we did at uh, eHealth uh, in Kerala. So, but this is good enough to understand. And the second uh, is uh, the way it is done, something known as HDFS or MapReduce and File System. And I'll get to this into the next slide. The third is uh, it's a Linux based set of tools, which is having the master slave uh, concept. And uh, it is a dis normally it's a distributed model, three tire, four tire, five tire. It's, uh, it's normally a distributed model, which makes it easier for us to uh, analyze and take it ahead. So this is uh, how a uh, simple uh, architecture would look where you know there are multiple saves, slaves below which have the task tracker and the data node and then you have one master tracking it and then you can have oh, sorry. worked somehow and you can have multiple task trackers master trackers for sets of uh, slaves who in turn report back to a master tracker. So uh, the difference between the master tracker and the slave is that that will also have a job tracker and name node. So it's primarily you know kind of uh, ensuring that there is some structure to the whole thing uh, which ensures that the big data which is broken down into smaller pieces is analyzed well and the information is received and uh, the output is uh, given it. And this is based on Linux. Let's take a use case because uh, you know trying to understand this might be a little difficult. So I thought of taking a very good use case, and that is of marriage. I think many of you are for marriage, marriageable age, so or just married. So if you're just married, it doesn't make sense. So this this is a traditional way, you know, in which uh, many of you must have seen uh, marriage uh, matrimonial sections in newspapers. You know, you have various categories. Uh, religion, height, weight, monetary, and uh, basis this, you know, people used to choose or traditional way of, you know, calling up and doing it. And uh, now you have something called as e-harmony, where you can be as happy as a couple, you know, right in the left corner. And e-harmony, what is e-harmony? E-harmony is basically it's a laboratory. They call themselves a laboratory. And uh, this is uh, pr uh, primarily based on big data. And this laboratory has uh, is, is present in 150 countries across the world. It has uh, close to 33 million members. Okay, and it doesn't end there. There are 15,000 people who take a test every day. Uh, you know, a written test. 15,000 new people who keep taking tests every day. And this is not a dating site, not a chatting site. It is a marriage site. Very clear e-harmony long-term relationship site. So they are very well advertised in that sense. And uh, 532 average marriages happen every day. So what is the trick behind this? You know, let's understand the technology behind this. So how does it really happen? So they have a questionnaire which is based, it's a 258 point questionnaire, you know, based on values, beliefs, emotional maturity, skills, various levels of questionnaires. Second is even their behavioral aspects are studied online. So if a person takes a test, uh, once he finishes off the entire 250 questions, even the way he responded and the, what he does online, his social aspects of it, social media, that is also studied online. Basis which there is a big data match. So you have now 33 million people and lakhs of people taking the test every day. So there's a big data match which matches algorithms and they have a specific traits of happy couples. So they try to do a big data match and trying to give certain matches which will try to ensure happy couples and which is then uh, fed back to the participants uh, who can then you know, take it up in their own manner. 
so uh, this is you know one of a simple case uh, that is uh, there on marriage second common case i was i planning to put this first but i thought i'll put the marriage first just to create kindle some interest so this is uh, something which is very commonly done for the last many years primarily four feeds that go into credit card transaction the transactional data which is basically you know your swipe data and various cities various places that is swipe in and the amounts also you also have the social media behavior which is also analyzed and then you have your own profile data this is multiple feeds and uh, then you have something called the mobile behavior and all these four go into a black box which is a big data analytics box which then feeds it analyzes it and decides on the uh, fact whether you should be a platinum customer silver or gold it also decides on what channels you watch and also you know in terms of uh, it'll it'll get a lot of uh, analysis throw a lot of priorities and throw a lot of information around it basis uh, the information that it gets and this essentially again will be on a hadoop art architecture which will uh, ensure that all the data that comes in so now you can kind of understand all the data that comes in is broken down analyzed using various uh, linux master safe concepts task trackers data nodes and then which is again fed back and the outputs are gone through any questions on these couple of uh, case studies in this case normally they'll either do uh, a three tier uh, a three tier tree in which case they will they will actually map the various values benefits emotional status etc it's normally not signature it could be decision tree and uh, they will also analyze the, so there are two different uh, streams of thought one is the question that is filled and second is the behavioral aspects of of the particular person no uh, both while taking the test and they also analyze it offline that is when his general behavioral aspects orwellian world yeah so this is something that they will do you know uh, offline and analyze it they'll take a few days and come it Yes, you are you are talking about the final thing. Okay, so very interesting. In fact, uh, I went through. I don't want to show it because it will be very complicated. So happy couple. While I mentioned just happy couple, there is actually happy couple one, happy couple two, happy couple three, and there are hundred different sets of happy couples depending on which country, which uh, state you are in, or which uh, background you come from, and depending on uh, the analysis that big data does. it will put you in a, into a particular bucket of happy couple so there will be you know hundreds or 200s of different uh, traits i mean if we all can understand um, you know of uh, buckets of happy couple uh, you know combinations combinations right word so there are a lot of combinations of traits that could be there but depending on the various attributes that come you will be put into a particular combination and then you know you can take it ahead done the huge 33 billion members so that's why i mentioned right at the start 33 million 15000 take the test and uh, it's a huge thing across with multiple cultures multiple yeah possible to cheat so interestingly this uh, questionnaire that is there uh, it uh, it uh, tr it's a tricky questionnaire it will keep changing and it will also um, map you know 1 and 11 and 21 there'll be a lot of uh, checks in the questionnaire so even if you cheat by one place you know in another questionnaire unknowingly you'll be caught so it's difficult task so your true nature will somehow come out there yeah, they they don't really say unable to match they'll say they'll just put in hold and wait until you get a match very positive website they say everybody can get married
so this is a, a reality which might hit shortly all devices connected and uh, this again is will have to be built on the groundworks of big data not just of one house but it's also it can this is just an example of a single house household and how big data affected it in all its aspects right from the car up to the fridge and up to various other aspects of stereos and food etc but uh, a, a completely connected world you know goes well beyond that and this is just the beginning and uh, big data is here to kind of analyze and trying to create solutions for them as well as you know for society at large so before i go into i just thought of getting to 10 use cases i'll just run them down just wanted to check any any questions from your end any inputs so that i just know that we're going on the right track anybody from here i mean all of you have been quite silent just want to understand are we going on the right track you understanding everything yeah no uh, hadoop is one of the best tool it's actually a set of tools open architecture it's not a software or anything so it's uh, it's a style of analyzing big data which is a distributed style which is among the best Uh, but big data can be analyzed by various other methods and there are uh, methods of only analyzing print or uh, non print data which are very specific in nature in terms of structure but when you look at the entire structure in place it seems to be you know one of the one of the best yes you had a question sorry oh see over here okay some of the uh, use cases and i have actually put process changes old to new uh, the first is sentiment analysis so some of it are you know related to advertising or sales sentiment analysis is trying to understand like i mentioned the reno duster which was launched and trying to understand sentiments of the market live feedback is something that you can get through big data live feedback it's not you know old it's not yesterday is not day before it's an ongoing feedback data processing using the structures can reduce in you know, all the way from 10 hours to even 10 minutes and this is a reality can be done market basket analysis i'll come to that in the next slide customer churn so when i i i worked in airtel myself and uh, for 6 7 years and we had this thing called customer churn which means you measure how many customers are going out every quarter customer churn is basically uh, analysis of uh, the number of customers that leave your services every quarter in a telecom industry or various other industries but uh, complete analysis of who they are why they have left what are the feelings they had when they left is something that uh, is the promise of uh, big data it's actually not predicted in the future i purposely changed it's known as prediction analysis i just mentioned it prediction in the future so they have a way of trying to predict number of uh, the variety of people coming in or the Uh, or the kind of uh, so which you know i have to do through telephone calls etc so but big data can have that predictive facility in place saying that hey if there is such a kind of lecture in such a kind of situation this will be the general crowd that is coming in from this particular location and probably if this is in bombay or delhi it could change so uh, predicting the future <coughs> ideas for advertisement again this was actually advertising analysis but uh, big data gives a lot of ideas for different kinds of uh, advertisements that can happen weather forecasting again real time holistic healthcare basis multiple parameters hundreds of parameters yeah there are uh, today a lot of uh, places doing very critical healthcare on small small parameters or specialists in small small fields but it's possible that when you integrate the entire uh, all all this uh, details together you get a holistic uh, treatment without any side effects fraud detection again on credit cards the slide that i showed earlier let's go to market basket analysis and uh, <coughs> this is a traditional analytics that people uh, do you have the sales records and you have a transaction id 
the number of transactions that come in you have the customer id various customers and you have the products bought so anything that you see in this if you just analyze this for a minute p5 p8 occur together anybody else yeah and in which p5 p8 are multiple that's the product side okay cross sell p11 and p5 p8 in fact you're going on the right track yes any others from here silent crowd only two people answering from front and back yeah customer 12 often comes to the market yes you take it a step ahead he does come to the market and what does he do he generally or always orders p9 yes so this is a traditional analytics that we have done uh products p5 p8 often bought together multiple of you told it and customer 12 likes product p9 but we're still on the traditional way so how does big data really make a difference in this it has something known as association rule discovery and i've actually put it in a very uh, in a very short manner and i i hope i can get it across but the depth of what what is uh, going to uh, you know what we're going to discuss next i shouldn't say what i'm going to say now i hope what you get out of this uh, few words next is much deeper than you know what it is so i've just taken a few examples and uh, so assuming there are two products you know lijjat papad and amul ghee and uh, you put a particular rule in which there is a consequent and an antecedent even if you don't understand doesn't matter just you know there are two part uh, particular rule in which you put initially amul ghee as a consequent consequent means the normal english word right consequent after after action and you put uh, lijjat papad as a ante antecedent and here you try to analyze what are the patterns of purchases that happen where amul ghee is at the consequent of the products you know what are the kind of patterns that happen and similarly what are those patterns that happen when lijjat papad is in the antecedent and if it if you remove the such a product if you remove the papad product will it also affect some other products in a category and thirdly if you put both in the antecedent and the consequent what are the other product lines that it can affect so it's a little more comprehensive than uh, than what's mentioned here very more complicated than this where you're really trying to see a trend that in case you make a small shift in your supermarket shelf so this is basically on supermarket shelf management if you make a small shift even in the location of the supermarket shelf management what will be the short term and long term consequences you're trying to predict it so it's a it's a very strong predictive tool and this can be done through analysis of this data and you know coming up with a lot of uh, inputs on it this is not the best of examples i have just put it on my own this is my own creation but it's possible that you know you the the real way to do it which is still nascent in the market is where they really understand that when you either input a product or take off a product what will be the changes that could take place very well predicted and it's a very good marketing tool sales promotional tool supermarket shelf management and second of course is inventory management so two different products and uh, the reason i've chosen is the both products are not related to each other you know papad and ghee are not really related to each other okay milk and bread are normal or milk and eggs is normal but two unrelated products but still they have some sort of a relation with each other and to understand that relation Uh, there is a large amount of analytics to be done and you know that can be done through uh, big data normally uh, we sip through the data yeah and find out the antecedent and consequent yes based on support and contrast hmm. so here you are using it as some kind of a what if analysis right? yes 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 So uh, tools uh, give kind of a facility. Yes, they give. 
is being built. So it's much more than what if. I agree with what he said. I just mentioned this as a basic start. But it could be much more complicated than that. It could be multiple products. You know, what if, so and so, so and so, and, 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 and then finally if. So it could be multiple what's, multiple ifs. These things are done in practice. It's real time. It will be done real time. Yes, 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 yes. It will also, so also show up uh, some queries that it will predict some queries that you need to run. So it will be an uh, automated uh, predictor. It might uh, detect some particular uh, anomalies in the trend of purchases, which can then uh, throw up a lot of light on how your shelf should be managed. The second uh, case study here is on collaborative filtering, which is again on prediction, uh, taken at uh, movies, uh, theatres and books. So what movies a person may be interested in, basis as past preferences. And when I say past preferences is not related to movies, even as behavioural characteristics, demography, and uh, other people with similar preferences, and finally the preference of such people for such a movie. So various associations, various rules, that can be done to have a collaborative filtering and uh, giving some sort of a prediction for the future. And second is trying to cluster movies. And uh, you know, there are movies and there are people and you keep it in a loop fashion. Movies goes to people and again you get the people, you check the movies and you run a loop around this, around these first two lines. And then you reach an equilibrium, which will create some sort of a cluster for the movie. This can be done on a large scale. Yeah. Oh, forward, oh, sorry. Yes. This collaborative filtering. So, uh, when you say algorithm, it means uh, what, what exactly are you referring to? So. Prioritizing, correct. So here, uh, there's no real fixed rule. You can use any algorithm, uh, depending on the data that's coming in. Uh, it can be uh, either a cluster or it can be any other kind of algorithm that can suit the purpose. Object was more on the use case. I was not trying to draw in on the algorithm. And then we have text and graph mining. So text mining is again, you know, what is mentioned, textuals that are there. And graph is, basis multiple graphs that are there. And this again needs to be collated, analyzed and brought back. And uh, data streams are basically, as I mentioned, huge, fast changing streams. The same data which is, you know, continuously changing on an ongoing basis. Uh, there are challenges. There are multiple ways again of analyzing data, data streams, landscape window, sliding window, damp window, multiple, I'll not get into depth of it, but just to give a gist, the landscape window is basically analyzing the entire of the data stream that's coming in. And you have the sliding window where you analyze a part of it, damp window where you, uh, you just take a very small portion of it and try to get some information related to the data stream. Because the volume is very large and the velocity is very large. So here you have continuously changing volume and velocity. Do you think an orchid will ever be able to tell its story? Do you think a flower will one day tell us where it was grown? How it was treated? Or how it got here? 
Do you think it's possible to teach traffic to speak? Do you think a car can call an ambulance faster than a phone? Do you think it's possible for devices to automatically deliver important, often life-saving data to those in charge? Can you imagine an ambulance that gathers critical information before arriving at the hospital? And that a patient could be examined before he even enters the emergency room, saving precious time. For the patient, and his family. None of this is science fiction. It's all part of a concept that our team has been working on for several years, the Internet of Things. The main challenge for making this dream come true is finding a way to connect many different applications and technologies in one coherent network. The thing is, they are not connected. One, For instance, two, three, there are six different six. systems at work in our medical example. We call them silo applications. Before the devices can talk to each other, we need to provide them with a common language. In other words, a set of design rules, protocols and interoperable technologies. So, how do you build the future? You identify, predict, analyze, and assess the forces of social change. We begin with information. We talk about big data, vast amounts of data flowing from every imaginable source. However, perhaps the most important piece of information can be found within us. With measuring devices, sensors, and genetics, we have a deeper understanding about who we are. A high percentage of Finns say they like monitoring their own health, looking after themselves and having a say in their treatment. But there is a significant gap between this understanding and our healthcare systems. If we could combine our personal data with our healthcare services, we would have a new system at hand. A system based on real human needs. It's time to move from nursing to health promotion. Do you ever stop and wonder about all the weird, amazing signals and functions we have? With advanced electronic services, outside traditional healthcare, we can give people more and more options with treatment. Imagine getting treatment via webcam from the comfort of your own home. Self-care and making our lives easier by giving us more opportunities to look after our own health. So before we break for a five minute break, I think that's as per the one hour, one hour, just wanted to check if there are any questions that you all have. Market basket and the compatibility. Yeah. Are we including? We are, we are. Machine learning, right? Right. We are including it. Oh, okay. So that was just a. Yeah. Uh, because even in the videos that I chose, uh, there is a lot of machine, machine interaction. So machine learning is going to be part of it. Ah, okay. So, th th would that be covered in the course? In the in the in the next hour? It will be covered. It will be covered. Yes. Ah, okay. Cool. Thanks. Any other thoughts, questions? Uh, actually, that what he's referring to is machine learning. When you say machine learning, is basically the uh, learning from the connected items that are there, which give information back. Data mining is primarily, you having a lot of data and you're trying to make some sense out of it. Yeah, but... Uh, uh, 
Yeah, basket is not related to uh, neither data mining or th that's only data. But he's referring to the other one, which is uh, the video we saw, uh, machine learning and you know various other aspects. Any qu questions from here? So we'll break for a five minute break is what you want, yeah, and we'll come back in five minutes. Okay, so uh, while you're being served coffee, uh, we'll just have a quick quiz time. So very basic questions and whoever answers it correctly, they will give you a, a, a goodie from fire, okay? Uh, so mm, the first question is, well, have you heard about Z1, uh, the world's first uh, binary digit computer? Okay, well, the question is who actually uh, founded Z1? Who is the father of Z1? Whoever knows the answer should raise your hands first. Come, okay, first, no, no, he. Conrad Zeus? Yeah, that's the correct one. So, uh, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm uh, Prasid Pai from UST Global. Thank you. Mm. Okay, so the next question is, um, who uh, actually co-founded Hotmail uh, in 1996 and uh, later he sold it to Microsoft? Samir Bhatia, okay, but I heard the answer first from Sameer him. Sameer Bhatia. Sameer Bhatia, yeah. Okay. So there you go. So uh, please... I'm Preet from Alliance. Yeah. Well, I think the questions are pretty simple. That's why uh, uh, we get the answers very easily. Right. Okay, uh, so the next question is uh, about CD. Uh, what's the sampling rate uh, of uh, CD? Anyone else Ex uh, other than Mr. Prasid Pai? No, okay. 44,000 uh, samples per second. Yeah, that is actually a, a round figure. Yeah. More specifically. 44,144. Okay, correct. Fine, so maybe you get two pens. <laughs> okay, so that's it. Thank you. So I guess uh, we'll take some more time for coffee. Uh, so in the meantime, so how many have uh, attended? No, who are the first, like it's, a, it's your first time in Firepot 80. How many are there like that? Actually, in fact, I see so many new faces now. Okay, one, two, three, four. Yeah, okay, we have so many people who are new to this uh, session called Firepot 80. So how did you come to know about the session? From your friends, so you have already attended the session. So I got a mail from my HR. Okay, so basically what brought you all together, I think it's your like interest for the topic, big data, Hadoop and all such things. So how is the session so far? Is it too technical or is it very interactive or you, you, find, you found the session interesting? Yes. Uh, any special uh, comments about the session, like about Firepot 80 in general or any special topic which you would like to discuss in the next or in the upcoming Firepot 80 events, anything like that, any suggestion? Anyone? Uh, 
Uh, hi, I am Sumin from Alliance. Myself, Preet, I'm also working with Alliance. What I will do is that I will stand up. So, I am Preet, I'm al I also work for Alliance. I work in the IT department of Alliance. Uh, I am Naveen, um, I work in RM Education. Uh, my uh, domain is marketing. Hi all, hey, good evening and I am Minu, I work in RM as test lead. Thank you. Hi all, myself Arya. I am a homemaker right now and aspiring to have a career in data analytics. Hi all, my name is Anjali and I am from, from RM. My domain is testing. Hi all, uh, I'm Gio Baby from Aram. I'm Gio. Yeah. Hi, I'm Vinoy from Triple IT MK. I'm doing my MPhil research. I am Mithun from Sirocco, working as SEO manager. Hello everyone, this is Kiran from Alami. Hi, I'm uh, Perimal from Alami Images. I'm a database administrator. Hi, myself Mansoor from Alliance. I work with uh, MIS team. Hi, m my name is Mithun and I'm from uh, Aram. Hi all, I'm Alex from Aram. My domain is networking. Good evening all of you. Myself, Vivek Jain. I'm from uh, IIITMK. Uh, I am a MSc CSIS student, second year. You, peace solution. Hi, I am Simmi. I am from Aram. Hi, I am Reshma. I am from Aram. I work in IT domain. Hi, I am Divya, coming from Aram. Hi, all. I am Arun from Nokmi Technologies. And my domain is a support engineer on Linux service. Hello, I am Shajana. I am working in Thoughtline Technology. I am Shamir, working as a QA lead in Thoughtline Technologies. Hello, I'm Ibnaz uh, from Triple MTMK. Hi, I'm Shafi from Triple MTMK. Triple MTMK. Hi, I'm Vibin from Triple MTMK. I'm Jidin from Triple MTMK. I, um, I am Madhu from Osanta Technologies. I work as a technical consultant. I am from Bav I am Bavya from Travancore Analytics. Hello, uh, my name is Basil. I am uh, coming from, I am working in Travancore Analytics, currently a trainee in da data science department. So myself, Amjad, I am working in Travancore Analytics, basically in analytics field. I am Oliver from Faith, working as project manager. Hi, good evening to Anandal. This is Divakar from Cognab Decision Solution. I am working as a big data engineer. Hi, I am Anjana from Softex Digital. My name is Prashant. I am the manager of IT for CV Support Systems Private Limited. It's in Patmanabham. It's a transcription company. Hi, I am Nuseba, working as a lead engineer in Triassic Solutions. Hi, I am Sean from Triassic Solutions. Yeah, hi, I'm Naveen Naushad. I have been a freelance Android developer for the last five years. Hi, I'm Rahul. I'm from Aram. I'm Vineet from Saturn System Wares. Uh, myself, Hafiz. I run a startup called Network City Solutions.
are just starting. No, no. Sorry. Yeah. Also, it's going on live. Okay. Just trying to get a different. And RM education, so many people. So you're into marketing, you mentioned. And you're into. Okay. Uh, then, I mean, we have variety of things like people management, PMO team. What else we have? So he is into Google Analytics, I guess. Okay. Any questions so far from students or Travancore or y'all? Over business intelligence, you mean? So, big data primarily is where there's huge volume of data. Business intelligence is very specific, very specific of trying to get intelligence out of one specific area. Big data caters to. That's the reason why I showed you right the petabytes, exabytes, and yottabytes, etc. And uh, the BI tools that we have, BI BI tools, business analytic tools, as well as business intelligence tools, in various parameters, CRM or whatever y'all y'all may be doing, I'm not very sure. It will cater to very specific uh, use cases with a limited amount of data, but it will go in depth in that. Vice versa, in big data, it will cater to a huge spectrum of services, I mean, uh, sorry, data, but it may not be as de deep as that. For example, let's say a BI tool, which my uh, area is automotive, so I'll just talk about that. A BI tool in an automotive scenario can go very deep into the actual functioning of the automotive when he goes to a showroom or to a particular uh, warehouse back for uh, repair, it will go right up to the analytics of the engine, compressor and various other details and it will give a lot of inputs, bases, a uh, lot of intelligent input bases that particular model make and that particular person. This may not be necessary and may not be possible in a big data scenario. Because of the uh, interconnectivity that's happening, the first video I showed, you know, there's a lot of interconnectivity that's happening across the entire world, across all the apps. So it is uh, becoming imperative that big data needs to be, you know, kind of adopted. OLAP is basically the structure. So basically structured, semi-structured, quasi-structured and unstructured. OLAP is only part of it, which is the first structured. The first, you remember the slide? Okay. And then you have the semi-structured in which they talked about XML passing, CSV, etc. Then you talk about uh, structured which is click stream, and finally the unstructured that we print and uh, you know uh, any digital media text, you know, it can be text. So OLAP and OLTP is just a small portion of it. Whereas uh, BI will only work on uh, structured data. Yeah, it will only work on part of that. This uh, is kind of makes a meaning to everything that is there, all the inputs that come. And over and above that, it also now start getting into the emotional aspect of things. So it will actually go beyond structures. Any other question from the students, I thought, you know. Yeah. Sorry? Yes, yes, yes. It might disappear soon, yes. This will take over everything. You're talking about the traditional warehouse tools? It 
it will become a subset of this of all the data that is there here. Volume, variety, and velocity. Just take a mic, I think that's better. That people listen to you. Yep. So in a traditional warehouse, currently how the processing of data happens is in a single server, maybe in it's a physical or a VM. So which can process a maximum of let's say one TB. Yes. Multiple algorithms to choose for the business, which will be the good, it will take long. That is the reason actually big data has been there. Yes, big yes. It's been for more than 15 years. But it is not been aware to many of us because the way we don't have any exact technical persons of big data because most of the big companies hire them and they develop their own. It has been given to a proprietary like Microsoft and Facebook. So definitely, I don't think it can't be a replacement for a traditional BI. Hmm. But as you said, it will be a value added. Yes. Because we are with and petabytes of data when traditional BI. Hmm. Definitely, it will take time. So in big data, we can broke the data into chunks and we can process in even like a desktop machine. It's server class multiple machines. At the end, it will make a meaning of all that. Yeah. And not just uh, structures, it will also be uh, unstructured data. Right when you showed with a master and slave. Yes. Which will act as a master and there are other servers which will act as a slaves. Which will process, for example, slave one process one algorithm, slave two process other algorithm. Correct. Correct. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Like only difference is you're, you should understand that there are many variety of structures that are there. So that's the only difficult part of big data. Yeah, continue. What are the tools we are going to use for each analysis? Are we going to cover that or what is the main things we are planning to cover? Uh, here actually I am not this because it is a varied audience. I am not covering the tools. Yeah. Okay, others, I did not want to put them to sleep. You know, so, uh, But there are various tools. I am just going to cover one case study which I have done for eHealth Kerala to uh, That is probably the last slide and I will cover that case study on Hadoop and Big Data on cloud. So it will be combined on everything. How about that data structure? It will be good to explain with like volume of data. What? Yes, 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 yes. All that I'll cover on that one case study. Yes, please. You can ask any question. I mean, since you're. A My question is. Uh, yeah. What are the basic skills required to be in this field? And second question is uh, how it will help in uh, cyber security. See, cyber security. In fact, that's my second last slide on uh, something known as the Orwellian world. I will explain to you on security aspects. You are talking about cyber security from a large scale perspective, right? When information is av available across. And the first question, what? What is the first question? But, uh, to make a career in this field, in big data, I mean. There is no basic skill required as such. I think you all are doing something related to IT. We are from cyber security. Okay. So big data can be uh, accessed from various ways, you know, from data warehousing or from uh, business intelligence, from, yeah, or from uh, security aspects. So it's basically something that will centrally run. You need to access it from whichever area or domain you uh, are comfortable with. But it will touch all areas of the, uh, of the sphere. And coming to uh, cyber security, uh, I will explain that to you right towards somewhere towards the end. As long as you know something uh, on the basics of uh, structures, structures of data, which is the first thing. Because to know something which is unstructured, you need to know what is structured. And so when I say structured, you need to know end to end of you know all the old TPS, apps and all this stuff. And when you can find that, warehouse that and do intelligence on that, on the structures of data, that I think would be a good foundation for you to take it to the next level. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah. He's a student, so he may, he may not have a, yeah. Data warehousing. So uh, something on OLAP is important. So something on the online analytic processing, which will take care of some basic skill sets in analytics, will take it to the next level. Okay. Okay, Hadoop is not a language, uh, SAS is, uh, but he would need to know some of what he mentioned here. Actually, well, I'm not sure what he needs to know. He needs to know <laughs> some stuff to come in. Oh, you also want to know. So, it's a very uh, broad question and uh, I'll get back to you on this. Fresh out of college, what do you need to know to get it? Okay. okay. I'll answer it, I'll answer it. So, now I wanted to cover... Uh, a small area on cloud. Okay, so I want to throw this question to the audience, and uh, you'll be quite surprised. I've been quite surprised. People know a lot of things about cloud, and uh, but uh, they really don't seem to know. So I just wanted to understand from your perspective. You know, anybody, all of you have touched cloud from various perspectives. So if I throw up a question, what exactly is cloud? What will be answers? You can just talk, no problem. Okay. Okay. Through a portal. Okay, self service basis through a portal. Okay. You understood it? What is cloud? Any other versions? What is cloud? Yeah. Yes. Hmm. So you're talking about uh, Infrastructure, IAS or uh, platform as a service, SAS, etc. So uh, let's go with the basic uh, trying to build up the foundation. And I uh, you know for all the people, uh, if you hear this for the next 10 minutes, you'll understand exactly what is cloud. So there is a difference uh, between insourcing and outsourcing. And uh, cloud starts with this premise that uh, there are uh, people, like she mentioned, who want to outsource. And uh, what it is, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. For which I've taken a very simple example, and that is of food, which all of us understand. And uh, there are various categories how one cooks food. The first is I cook food on my own, self. I do it myself. Very simple to understand. The second is I employ a housemaid, and I provide all the raw material for her to cook the food. Bachelors, all of you know it, I mean, you get somebody and you tell them to start cooking food. Third option is you employ a home food agency and they provide the raw material and the cook. So here in the first case, you're doing it on your own, your resources are yours, the person also is yours, you yourself. The second case, you have deployed somebody else to the cooking. In the third case, you have also... Uh, they provide the raw material. So you're not giving any raw material also. They are cooking and doing on their own. They are doing a home food agency. And final is uh, caterer. They provide the cooked food at your doorstep. In which case you don't even use your kitchen. Your kitchen is spot clean. 
and uh, the final is you forget everything and go to hotel and eat food so uh, unconsciously or consciously we go through all these phases and if you actually understand these phases well you will actually understand what is cloud okay. and from here actually i am going to build up and say what is cloud so basically the way we are outsourcing it and why do we do it so why do we move up the chain the first is you want to focus on your core competency so my core our core competency or whatever you all are is probably you know working or sitting in office or a student or doing some uh, analytics in some remote iot you don't want to cook your own food so that's you know your core competency is not cooking food so that's the reason why you move up the chain the second is you want to reduce costs if you're doing it on your own possible that your costs are much higher when you give it to a large caterer the costs are much lower you get a better quality and performance better quality and performance than doing it yourself it's always standard and you can keep checking it you get a predictable quality one is better quality predictable you always know that this is kind to be the kind of uh, you know you're going to get you get predictable timelines at this particular time you'll get it that's for sure and uh, it is something which is acceptable and uh, these are the same parameters that you would have even for any outsource or when you give it off on a saas pas ias platform these are some of the parameters that you know you will be looking into the reason why you move up the chain why you go to cloud and uh, coming to a it example on cloud you have a manufacturing company which has legacy legacy means old grown applications infrastructure managing with in house team they have in house team managing it that's the level 1 level 0 sorry and then you have level 1 where you start managing their legacy infra and apps it's still not cloud you're just managing them as a system integrator or as application integrator you start managing their apps and infra level 2 is you start modern, modernizing that you start making that legacy into modern they have something legacy you start changing technologies so you kind of modernize the applications and then you keep sustaining it and the duration starts increasing so if you notice you know here it is a duration starts increasing as you go up the value chain level 3 is when you actually buy it out on something known as a financial buyout and then you continue to maintain it on your own again the duration increases because now you're doing a book value purchase and the uh, increases but it's still not cloud many people at level 3 say this is cloud many many people have seen even senior people uh they they look at level 3 and they say it's cloud it's still not cloud you so you only done a financial buyout your bought out is for is uh, equipment and you are managing it with your team it's still not cloud and then you have a fourth where you move everything that they have into the data center and charge them a rental mode and this is still not cloud so here uh, again there is a lot of uh, cloud uh, companies <laughs> who give level 4 as mentioned and say you know giving cloud it's still not cloud they are only doing a rental model rental is different from cloud and then level 5 actually starts the cloud model a cloud model the key thing is pay per use so that's one of the key things that you need to realize that you are only charging them as what they use just like your electricity bill they what they use charge if you're going to charge them on a rental model between 4 and 5 then it's rental it's not allowed so any case uh, infrastructure as a service platform as a service software as a service all good jargons but uh, they should be charging on a pay per use model only as you use you should the person should be i mean the financial structure that's the first level of cloud and then it goes on okay that's amazon is one of the classic cases and then it goes on to the next step which is paper revenue which is a little more little more complicated so paper use is you know, when they use you pay paper revenue is when he gets his revenue you get a portion of it for example live uh, ke, uh, use case was when i think uh, ibm signed up with airtel on a paper use model for a particular product line it was when for every sim card that airtel sold ibm would get you paise so you are linking your uh, revenues on his revenues so that's paper revenue 
it's a higher level of uh, cloud services and uh, this uh, has been done very few companies because a lot of risks involved and last is when uh, a particular accounting center or a particular business unit is totally managed by the person so this is the three levels that you can go through in uh, cloud and uh, what increases is value addition duration of contract as go up the levels commitment scalability premium of course relatively and more important is trust so as you give it away you know trust needs to go on increasing and what decreases is one is the uh, of course initial investment is certainly decreasing second you know why people don't go in for cloud or why what the hesitation of any kind of outsourcing not just cloud even rental model etc the control in the process and the method used you have lot of controls i mean going back to the example of the food you cook your own food you can decide what to cook but when you give it to a catering agency he gives what he makes the control is much uh, lower and there's no less a control manpower again going back to the example of the food you have a control of the manpower there so no who's cooking and what's happening and last is our security playing safe or security so a lot of information can there's a trust factor that needs to be enabled to ensure that to they deliver the right services in a secure environment in a small example on real estate office space in uh, similar uh, foray on owning building and furniture renting building and i just run through it lack of time but similar story you know you can get in all industries those cases the evolution of uh, the models and uh, just want to give a small case study something that live happened very coincidentally in trivandrum one of the first cases in uh, india and this was a uh, adu pawn cloud in big data this is for the e health department e health department kerala and uh, headquartered in trivandrum with multiple districts across and uh, if you look at it there are three, there were three levels that they defined and the first is the primary healthcare center this uh, is basically all the villages and the rural areas are there and then you have the district healthcare center which is you know one level higher and then you have the main healthcare center which is the trivandrum medical center and a uh, person who goes to various levels uh, they are all mapped using aadhar card i mean technically and so their uh, demographics and you know everything is mapped to a particular level and all the information is here at the primary healthcare center so the model of uh, this is a three tier architecture of hadoop where all the information is at a particular place it doesn't move up although they are connected it doesn't move unless you really want it to move and uh, so the case of a person at the lowest lowest level all the information stored assuming he moves from a village to a district because of his own issues or you know to get a better treatment only that information related to that person moves from here to here so at the level 2 it is light data but heavy data on request heavy data on request so that's the model of you know group and how they manage it otherwise the information stored here is a huge uh, sizes so you'll have x-rays you'll have the photographs and all all the medical reports which uh, can be you know a few gb per person I'm talking about millions of people so the information here doesn't go anywhere unless it is needed that needed could be 2 or 3 or 5% maybe 10% depending on whether the person wants to go from here to here and right on top you have uh, they normally only have reports and only if uh, it is necessary does the data move up to the higher highest level this uh, three tier model so this is uh, the model that was run the combination of uh, big data cloud hadoop and we have to discuss this further it's a very complicated one which ran across many districts with lot of complexities with the central unit which monitored everything and which used the aadhar number as the unique identification number because kerala is the only state which compulsorily 
everybody has an Aadhaar number. I myself don't have it. I've recently come into Kerala, so to get one quickly. This is one of the things told to us that you know, Kerala, a lot of people have. Everybody has 99 or most close to 100 percent. Using that uh, UID, whole portal software was revolving around it, and then that information, you know, moved up uh, from layer to layer. So privacy issue was a key issue and uh, none of the information that was stored in that particular central uh, database could be accessed except by a select group of people. So in a, the privacy of the uh, health reports of those particular people was uh, relevantly available using a particular uh, code of uh, security. You had to pass through three levels of security to get some particular reports. That was ensured all the three levels and uh, especially as when data moved from level to level it was ensured. You mean to say uh, name of the person? So uh, basic reports on top, uh, uh, yeah so basic report uh, would contain, contain very discernible data, very peripheral data where uh, no security may not be much of a concern but in terms of uh, in fact this came to be also a revelation to because uh, dealing with the government and so a lot of uh, people want to hide their health reports for various political reasons. So it's very important that uh, all the reports be confidential in that sense and only the peripheral data which is the topmost basic reports were accessible to others. It is distributed. So Hadoop basically is a distributed model has to be stored in a distributed manner and uh, below all the for me yes yes inside the state of Canada. with uh, uh, Hyderabad as a remote uh, Disaster recovery. Yeah, it was part of the project to computerize them with basic information and uh, basic uh, needs of computerization. It's uh, the pilot was run in uh, September uh, of last year for six districts, not for all, and it is going to be rolled out. It's in phases. So by 2018, it will be complete. It is the first of its kind in the whole of India and Kerala prides itself on being the first of its kind. So they always wanted to make something unique. And at that time, I was not in Kerala. I used to keep coming to Kerala. And uh, so it was the first of its kind that is there. No other state has it. No other state has a distributed architecture. They all have something called as they have all information everywhere which is a very basic rudimentary model. It's not a big data model. Uh, but this is the first of its kind where they implemented the Hadoop open set of tools with a big data kind of uh, setting. Very good question. In fact, it takes six months for us to train the doctors to capture the basic set of detail, details. There's a lot of resistance from the doctors. So one is implementing this, which is the first, first phase. Second is educating and convincing people like pharmacy and doctors and various others. Actually, there are a lot of, it's a huge story. You can go on talking about this because when you, when you start implementing this, there are a lot of things that come out of the closet. For example, a lot of medicines were sold, you know, on the streets in uh, sample medicines, you know, sold uh, in pharmacy stores because they have a connect with the, uh, with the healthcare units. So all that comes to a halt because this takes care of all accounting of every single bit of medicine. It takes care of every patient that walks in, how much time it takes, how much time he goes out. It also takes care of the doctor fees, you know, what they recommend. So there's nothing in between that can happen. So there's a lot of resistance, you know, from uh, uh, various departments. I'll get into it later.
So this throws up uh, the name of the patient as he comes in the queue. And you can actually see this in live in TMC if you're interested. It throws up the name of the patient and uh, it also gives in <laughs> the top 15 uh, general drugs that is required. It's a sort of predictive tool, not as good as it should be, but the top 15 uh, drugs uh, that are there, it will show it up right up front. So he doesn't need to scroll down all the way and you know, kind of give the drugs. So they've tried to make it very user friendly for the doctor, uh, user friendly for the pharmacist, user friendly for the laboratories, and uh, user friendly for the management to ensure that everything is run in place. Trust management. It is uh, uh, held singly at the central uh, data center in Trivandrum and all the rights authorities of the securities are uh, held uh, here. So in terms of trust, unless they approve, you know, nobody else can get it. And at each level, you have various people who will have the authority to take certain decisions or who can view certain levels of files. Indigenous, properly indigenous uh, developed system by the government. It's not a lot of people came, SAP, Microsoft, Oracle, all of their, their own SAP health and various other applications. But this is a self indigenously uh, uh, made application and uh, which was transferred back to the government of Kerala. Yeah. How many replications? Replicated copy of the data. Yes. You are talking about replication at this level or at the high, at the lower level? At the lower level, it will just be replicated once. Single. We have it at Hyderabad. Different seismic zone. As a normal concept of data center, if you have a data center here, you'll have a in a different seismic zone. Network security for Hadoop is inbuilt in the particular uh, software application, which will ensure a triple desk and ensure that there is a security available and uh, with authorities and securities rights given to specific individuals. Slave, of course, slave. Actually, I wouldn't say slave. Um, see, master-slave concept is a uh, is a Linux Linux-based set of tools. So it is neither of the two, neither master nor slave. It's stored in a particular database, which is accessed by the slaves. You understood what I'm saying? It is accessed by the slaves. It's just correct. The total volume of data there was, uh, it was less, it was less than 600 to 700 TB. The reason was because all the six districts were not using it completely. There was still a lot of resistance. When you deploy such a large scale application, the first thing you will come up with is resistance because they are doing it for the last 50 years or 100 years in some particular manner. To convince the entire administration to move up, it takes some time. The whole thing was run on cloud, so we only talk about core servers and core, yeah, the co number of cores needed for each levels of things. So, uh, and it keeps changing uh, as day passes. So the beauty of cloud is that, uh, as I mentioned, paper use, and when we say paper use, you have a set of cores. A core is nothing but, for the benefit of the students, is basically a set of uh, number of processors, number of memory, and some particular hardware. And a combination of this forms one core and then you can have multiple cores around it. So you can start small and as data increases, you can keep increasing the cores. So for your question, when we started off, it was you know, less than 20, 30 cores. But one 
on premises on premises started off yeah so forget okay yeah so i think you have described that uh, top 15 medicine is being displayed in yeah. another thing so just for processing this data around this uh, 700 tb how long it took the entire workflow was reduced to less than 5% of the actual time taken because the number of medicines and the number of uh, combinations was so high that when we reduced it to this top 15 and you know various other uh, parameter optimizations it came down to less than 5% and also queue management which I didn't cover right now that's also a huge topic so we ensured that the queue timing which we measured was reduced from around 40 45 minutes to less than 4 minutes you know when a person comes in a healthcare center the amount of time he stands at this point so a lot of queue is there as he takes his token so that time also has been reduced so uh, the entire process is uh, user friendly and uh, sooner or later people realize that it helps them only the time that it takes any other questions I'll show you a small video on cloud and we'll kind of end with that. We have five minutes more. A small demo on cloud uh, with the example given of a GCR with a shopping mart and uh, as you see it, you'll understand what it is. thing. Life is easier and safer. Various smart gadgets affect the daily operation of a smart city. And this is all possible thanks to you, me and many other smart people who are always tapping in to the latest technologies for a better urban life. Let's meet Linda, a pretty young fashionable lady who enjoys living a smart urban life. Her plan today is to go shopping at a mall. As Linda arrives, the surveillance cameras installed in the front door provide a sense of security and valuable data for intelligent video analysis is collected. Linda logs onto the free Wi-Fi network of the mall and receives advertisements and coupons based on her demographics. In a large fashion store, the beacon system can be used to navigate, redeem coupons and record Linda's shopping route. In a restaurant, she flips a service block on her table to inform the staff of her needs, flips the block to different sides to request different table side services. It's as though the waiter is always beside her. With a cloud pause system, the staff don't need to stay behind the pause counter. They come to her table to provide better and personalized service. The store knows Linda better and can deliver offers tailored to her preference and specific requirements. Digital signage broadcasting focused target marketing. Beacons guiding her to select suitable merchandise. An augmented reality system helping her try out clothes without actually trying them on. And many others. For afternoon tea, Linda has a date with her good friend Daisy at a popular cafe. She installs and uses the cafe's app to make a reservation. This app is seamlessly integrated with Google Maps and can direct her to the cafe from anywhere. A message pops up when her table is almost ready. And after a lovely tea time, discounts are awarded to Linda's app account thanks to her loyalty to the cafe. As the date with Daisy is coming to an end, Linda takes out her mobile again, switches on appliances at home, 
and get herself ready for another smart journey. So you may ask, how do retailers benefit from this world? Well, what it helps retailers to build is not only a smart space, but also batches of big data generated from mobiles, from pause terminals, and all kinds of sensors. Most impressively, the system's cloud report transfers the hardcore statistics into intuitive, easy-to-read dashboards, with which managers can work to decode their customers, to adjust product displays, to embark on more strategic planning, and to achieve greater business success. GCR has the expertise to provide Internet of Things solutions for retailers at all levels. Contact GCR now to help your business move forward and thrive. Visit us at gcrcloud.com. Traditional shopping mart, you know, how they have moved it ahead on this. So any further questions on uh, big data, Hadoop, cloud? Any thoughts? Yeah. Uh, let me correct, uh, get what you said. So you're saying uh, you have a software, you gave it the software to the client. Okay. And the data is managed? Okay. So uh, it's not cloud. What you've done is you've given a dedicated server to the client and uh, for his usage, for his data, and this server is in his premises, your premises, in your home, okay, <laughs> in, in your premise, in your premise, and you have created it. It's, it's still on a, a rental kind of model. So cloud is when uh, the client only pays when he uses. It's not a rental model. He will not have a fixed uh, monthly billing of X rupees per month. If you're having a fixed monthly billing, it's not cloud. The true cloud is where the client has a flexibility of having a base price, you know, some base value, and then he can burst. It's known as, you know, bursting from the cloud. So he has some base commitment and a peak commitment. And uh, the true cloud is where he is somewhere in between, you know, between what he is committed and someone, what he, some, ba some base value. Uh, that's on a paper use model. It can, the base also can be zero. So in this case, it's a dedicated server for this client and you can actually call it a rental model. Loosely termed as cloud in the market, but actually it's still on a rental space. Yeah. Now you're moving towards cloud, correct. If there are more clients and then they're sharing the same software and data, then it's moving towards a cloud space. It's still multi-tenant, but now he's saying it's uh, multi-customers using the same data and the same software. So virtual private cloud is the second level of cloud. So cloud has, you know, a private cloud, then you, you have a virtual private cloud and then public cloud. So uh, I'll probably take them to the next session. Cloud itself is a huge topic. So private cloud is, you know, where you just set up a cloud for the client probably in your premises. And then you have VPC, virtual private cloud, where you're talking about virtualization. Public cloud is where it's kind of open to all, something like uh, Amazon. So, so three. business model dictates that something, right? Yes, yes, Not yes. The Not the inflation. No, no, no. So I'd like to end this with a last uh, session, I mean, last thought, you know, welcome to the Orwellian world. So anybody knows who is Orwell? Orwellian, yeah. 
1984. So he wrote this book uh, just uh, as a passing thought. So you can spend a Wednesday evening thinking over it and Googling about it. In 1944, he wrote a book called 1984. And in this book, uh, he wrote some principles that happened and actually which never happened but now it is happening. And he nicknamed this as the Orwellian world. This is part of his surname and where he mentioned that there will be a lot of surveillance and you know, there will be no, nobody whose life is private. Everybody's life is public. Everybody's gone public. So, if you know exactly as you move out of you know, your home into the office or, home, or office back to home or you know, eating habits and this habits, it's actually kind of known by the government and he called that particular phrase as the government syndicate which will uh, run these particular, uh, which will run the particular Orwellian world. So, at the end of this presentation, I would like to actually invite all of you, welcome to the Orwellian world, because this is where we are headed to. So, thank you very much. In case you want to get in touch with me, please do so, anytime. And, uh, 7.05, so officially I want to call it a day. I don't want to keep them waiting, but if there are any questions, we can catch up now or later. Is that okay? Maybe a last few, two, three questions. Okay, so the tools, uh, you're talking about uh, e-healthcare, Hadoop tools, we'll take it offline. Yeah, we did MapReduce, HDFS and uh, file systems on a three-tier architecture. But, you know, I'll, I'll take it offline with you because the large mass is just beginning. Any other questions on thoughts around it? Was, yeah. Sorry. I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> Yes, so good question actually. So data center uh, has various levels. You know, you have a tier 1, tier 2, tier 3, tier 4 data center. And uh, cloud basically is rests on a data center. Okay, so they are, you should never be confused saying that, okay, if I have a data center, I have a cloud, it need not be the case. So let's see what data center is. So data center is a set of servers or applications or uh, uh, operating systems that you may have at a particular location. And uh, depending on the security scalability of that particular location, you can label it as tier 1, tier 2, tier 3. You might be knowing about it. And if you have, depending on the failure mechanism, it can go up to tier 3. Multiple uh, telecom vendors coming in, uh, multiple redundancies. So a combination of redundancies, availability, etc., can make it these particular levels. Cloud is something that is on this data center. It will be there in the data center. But... Uh, it is, uh, it is basically in the form of cores, you know, multiple cores, which uh, will be leased out. I mean, the entire application can be put on those cores. This is which you can have uh, various services that you offer from the data center. It could be on, on the form of infrastructure, it could be in the form of platform, or it can form software or application, commonly known as, known as IAS, PAS, SAS, and the uh, yeah, application as a service. And these are all use models where you know, the person can pay as he uses. So the cloud rests inside the data center, but it's nothing got to do with, you know, every data center is not a cloud. But every cloud rests in a data center. I think that's the best way you can put it. So every data center is not a cloud, but the cloud rests in a data center. We have given uh, big data, Hadoop, cloud, end to end. And we build the software also. For them. Yes. Only government. No private. Because again, security, right? Because uh, they don't, they can't uh, assure security if they go to Apollo's or something else.
IoT is much, much higher than data analytics and text. So IoT, as you saw the last video, the second last video, it is, it takes into consideration when a lot of things, you know, somebody talked about machine learning, a you know, lot of things are connected together and you create an analytics out of it. Data is only specifically related to structured data and, you know, as we know it. So most of whatever, you know, we know right now is related to structured data. That's something we need to understand. Uh, we analyze intelligence, intelligent uh, details that we do is all related to structured data in any field, any application. When you're moving out of structured data into the field of unstructured data, that's when you need to think of IoT, big data, you know, various other things. I'm through. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to all of you. Thank you so much. It was actually a fruitful session and we appreciate the patience you have shown in clarifying all our doubts and everything. Thank you. Uh, so as a token of our appreciation, I invite Mr. Deepu Aznath, the Managing Director of FIRE, to present a memento to Mr. Verma. So first of all, I would like to thank Deepak for coming all the way down from Kochi, right? And uh, giving a fruitful session on big data in a cloud perspective. Actually, he was able to explain it with a lot of analogies, which help us relate and understand it better. So thank you, Deepak. And I would like to thank NASCO for giving us such a wonderful speaker. So there is one more moment. It is a hand-drawn picture by Ratish. So I would like Ratish to hand over this picture to you. Okay. So I would like to thank you all for your time and patience uh, for coming down to fire and attending this session. So I think there are a lot of new faces. So this is the 40th edition of our session. Initially, it was known as Coffee at DBG. And after the merger with fire, we changed our branding. And now it is Fire Port 80. And it is a place where we could come and find people with similar interests. And it happens on first Wednesdays every month. So, uh, so this month, uh, that is, uh, we have been doing a couple of sessions on machine learning, uh, and then uh, this month we went to uh, data, and we will surely be getting in touch with you for your suggestions for the next topic, and this is also a place where you could become speakers. Okay, that, so if anyone is interested to become speakers, that is, we want people from the community to talk. That is, it is not from the outside. So, so it will be a great opportunity for you people if you are interested to speak. So is there anyone who is interested to take a session next time? You can surely get in touch with Raja. Okay. And any other questions related to uh, Fireport 80? And to keep track uh, with the events that we conduct, uh, we have a Facebook group called Techno Geeks. So the overall concept is just like, that is, we just want to know about the latest happenings. Where, uh, that is where our fire portity start with uh, Tech Bytes, which is a session that we talk about what happened in the last one month. And then we give an opportunity to, uh, even to our own team, to learn about the latest technologies that is happening around. And and it is a place where community of practice happens, where we could find a lot of friends and learn from each other. So make use of this opportunity and find new friends. Thank you.
so that's it thank you thank you everyone for your participation for your active participation and uh, you want to keep track of us you can follow us uh, in our facebook group techno geeks and you can even follow our facebook page fire usa uh, so you'll be keeping uh, updated about the events that we conduct and the technology updates also so thank you thank you mr verma thank you